this is going to swell up um, repeatedly. I don't know when the next episode will be, but it typically happens again and again. Um, I recommend removing this. There's two approaches. One is simply excising the cyst, um, and the other is doing a modified cyst trunk procedure. Cyst trunk procedure was described by Walter Cyst Trunk, who was a uh, uh, surgeon at the Mayo Clinic, um, I think around uh, the turn of the, the, the 19th century, so around 1900. Uh, he described um, these cysts in the neck that tended to be recurrent and developed uh, a procedure where he removed the central hyoid bone, a core of the base of tongue, and part of the, um, it's, uh, uh, did a pharyngotomy right into the, um, um, through the tongue into the pharynx. He, a year later, described a modification um, where he left the pharyngeal mucosa intact. And this has become the modified cystrunk procedure. Um, depending on which reports you look at, simple excision can result in a recurrence rate of up to 50%. Um, probably it's closer to 20 to 30%. Um, but with a modified cystrunk procedure, some people report 0% recurrence, but overall it tends to be about 2 or 3% recurrent. Um, when I express those numbers to parents, they generally are, are much in favor of um, <clears throat> doing a modified cyst trunk. Uh, so as we can see in the picture on the right, um, the cyst has been dissected free. The central hyoid bone um, has been cut, and then uh, it's demonstrating uh, a core of muscle being carved out from the base of tongue, um, but taking care to avoid uh, performing a, a pharyngotomy, which results in a salivary um, uh, exposure to the uh, wound um, and potential uh, saliva fistula. There are some textbooks that advocate for um, surgically removing thyroglossal duct cysts um, because of malignancy. While it's true that about up to 1% of these can harbor malignancy since there's thyroid tissue in the walls of these glands, um, it's generally papillary thyroid cancer, occasionally uh, follicular thyroid cancer. Um, these differentiated thyroid cancers, um, like we know from other, uh, from um, endocrine surgery, uh, are very indolent and uh, very, very unlikely to um, cause any sort of mortality. Uh, the general consensus in this topic is that um, the risk of malignancy should not influence the decision to operate on this. Um, there's a number of people who think that we should not even define um, papillary thyroid cancer as a carcinoma or a cancer um, just because it results in overtreatment. Um, so if there is uh, a malignant um, nest of cells found in the thyroglossal duct cyst, uh, it's reasonable to um, search the thyroid gland using ultrasound uh, for a nodule. 11% um, of the thyroid glands removed in this situation do have a micro um, carcinoma. However, it's very reasonable to um, leave the thyroid gland unless you find a large nodule and prove that it's malignant. They should follow along with um, typical uh, guidelines rather than um, rushing to remove their thyroid gland and um, resulting in those issues and comorbidities, um, complications. Um, <clears throat> one interesting um, note here is there's never been medullary thyroid cancer in a thyroglossal duct cyst. And if you think about the embryology of the C cells that cause medullary thyroid cancers, the C cells uh, are derived from the neural crest, whereas the rest of the thyroid gland derives um, from the thyroglossal duct cyst, and so, or thyroglossal duct. Um, and so there's no C cells present in a thyroglossal duct cyst to create medullary thyroid cancer. Okay, moving on to dermoids. Uh, a dermoid is a, um, epithelial aligned cyst uh, that forms in regions of embryonic fusion where the embryo folds and the ectoderm comes together and um, involutes uh, if any of that ectoderm 
um, remains, it can form a dermoid. It has a cervical presentation that resembles thyroglossotoxist, so they can show up in the midline or just off of midline. Um, but they are a simple cyst. Um, they're typically filled with keratin debris rather than muc muc mucin, and uh, they may contain animal appendages like hair or sebaceous glands. Typically, uh, the treatment is either observation um, for development of symptoms or an option of excision, and simple excision is curative as long as you don't leave any, any of the cyst wall behind. Um, when I am convinced that it's a dermoid, I typically offer the parents an option of uh, excision, um, but also say that it's totally fine to let this be. It'll probably grow slowly, um, <clears throat> but let it be until the, the child set expresses that they want it removed. Um, in Ann Arbor, we have a lot of parents who are a little anti-surgery, anti-intervention, and, and I've had a lot of patients um, take this option where um, they know it's there, they know it's benign now, and um, they're going to let it be unless um, some problems develop from it. Dermoids will contain ectoderm and mesoderm um, <clears throat> tissues. Uh, an epidermoid would, will, is uh, a similar lesion that only contains ectodermal um, tissues. It's usually more superficial, often adherent to the dermis. Um, dermoids can happen at a number of sites in the head and neck. Um, periorbital, eyebrow, um, like the top right picture, is uh, another common presentation. Um, nasal glabella is uh, a common presentation um, that is often um, discussed in more detail in a um, nasal mass talk. Uh, Suprasternal uh, and occipital are also uh, other sites in the head and neck where you can get dermoids. Okay. So we're moving on in our day and we get a consult from the emergency department. Um, Brittany, who's a 12 year old female um, and uh, presents with fever, um, is here because of a painful left neck mass. Um, <clears throat> she's had a draining pit on her neck um, all of her life and typically mucus comes out, but now um, pus has been coming out of it. This has been going on for three days of progressive pain and increasing swelling. Um, on examination, she has a four centimeter fluctuant mass that's located uh, kind of anterior, uh, but deep to the left sternocleidomastoid, sternocleidomastoid muscle. Um, the picture here is of the fistula, which occurs kind of right along the anterior border uh, of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. So just like before, um, slide your um, favorite answer up to the top. Okay, responses are slowing down. It's close, but the most people have voted for, um, sorry, I'm trying to move these controls around, branchial class cyst, and then some people feel like it may be a reactive lymph node. Um, <clears throat> this is good. Uh, so I was going for branchial class cyst. Um, nice job, everybody. A little bit of embryology, although I'm going to leave out a lot of the embryologic detail and a description of each of the arches and all their derivatives um, for an embryology talk. Um, but the branchial arches are uh, an embryologic feature. Um, there are five pairs of arches, and they kind of resemble gills. Um, on a very early embryo in that upper left picture. Um, <clears throat> the spaces in between the arches uh, externally are called clefts and internally they're called pouches and uh, there's predictable derivatives from each of these structures. Uh, the clefts uh, typically uh, close off and involute but any persistence of the cleft will result in a predictable uh, um, presentation of either uh, a cyst, sinus, or fistula 
based, based on um, which cleft um, it is persistent from. <clears throat> the most common branchial cleft cyst uh, is the second branchial cleft cyst, and that makes up 90% of these lesions. Um, <clears throat> just a, a word on terminology, a cyst is an epithelial lined space, um, but without any external connection um, to a body surface uh, or internal that, that is either. A sinus is uh, sort of a blind pouch um, and is a space like a cyst, but has a connection either internally or externally. And a fistula is an epithelial space like these two, um, but with a connection both external and internal. Uh, brachial cleft anomalies uh, can be um, any one of these um, structures. <clears throat> so with first brachial cleft cysts, um, they are subdivided into two types, and this is called work type. This is named after Walter Work, who is a former chair here at the University of Michigan. It's a purely clinical designation. There's no criteria or list uh, or items that we use uh, to define precisely what's a work type one and what's a work type two. Um, and it does lead to uh, a bit of a tongue twister name. And so these are first branchial cleft cysts, um, work type one or work type two. Um, not, you know, a work type two should not be confused with a second branchial cleft cyst. Um, so you got to slow down and be careful when you're trying to describe these and uh, name these. The work type one um, is generally parallel to the external auditory canal. Um, if it has a fistula, it's connecting to the external auditory canal and then out um, to the postauricular or even pretragal area. Um, the management of these is to do uh, a simple excision um, when it's not infected. So if you see the patient and it's all swollen, red, painful, um, give them antibiotics, let it cool off. Uh, I usually say about four weeks and then um, excise it. Um, but if I'm convinced that it's a type one, if it's all up close to the, um, I, I generally don't use facial nerve monitoring. In contrast, a work type two um, <clears throat> will have a cyst that uh, occurs closer to the angle of the mandible or the level two neck. The tract typically courses um, around the angle of the mandible um, through the parotid gland and terminates near the bony cartilaginous junction of the external auditory canal. Um, but there's a variable relationship with the facial nerve. About 29% pass medial to the nerve, under the nerve. Um, it's also possible that um, this cyst tract splits and uh, is, both, is present both uh, over top and underneath the facial nerve. Removing these type of lesions where the cyst occurs much lower in the neck um, near the angle of the mandible has a much higher risk of uh, facial nerve injury and should generally be done with a superficial parotidectomy approach and facial nerve monitoring. Um, <clears throat> another condition that needs to be distinguished from a first branchial cleft cyst um, type one would be a preauricular pit. So um, preauricular pits generally occur above the tragus and um, are persistent uh, due to uh, incomplete uh, fusion of uh, the hillux of his. Um, so there's a regular fusion between uh, the helix that make up the tragus and the helical cruce, um, but in general, the pit, the external pit is gonna be above the level of the tragus. If the pit occurs anywhere below or behind the tragus um, or behind the ear, these are gonna be first breaking of cysts. Um, and um, that would be uh, between the formation of the, the structure that becomes the tragus and the anti-tragus. Um, and will help you um, plan your approach and accurately diagnose um, these lesions. <clears throat> so moving on to the second branchial cleft cyst, this is gonna be the most common, 90%, 90% um, like I said before, um, of these branchial cleft cysts uh, arise from the second branchial cleft from the second branchial cleft. 
uh, <clears throat> its presentation is typically either a painless fluctuant mass or a secondarily infected, you know, painful and acutely swollen um, fluctuant uh, mass. It's generally deep to the sternocleidomastoid, uh, um, but, but closer to the anterior border uh, of the SCN. It, uh, if it has an external opening, uh, it's going to be somewhere along the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. But I've seen it um, low, close to the clavicle, um, but more typically um, near the mid portion of the SCM, um, higher near level two or three. If it has uh, an internal uh, opening, um, fistular sinus tract, this is going to terminate at the tonsillar fossa, since the tonsil is the uh, derivative from the second branchial pouch. Pouches are the internal structure, the tonsil arises. And so um, <clears throat> many people have tried to see these um, openings. In general, it's, it's in or um, amidst a um, cryptic tonsil. It can be anterior, posterior, um, anywhere in the tonsillar fossa. And so it's generally not possible to find um, the internal fistula openings. And tonsillectomy um, is what you do if you suspect that there's a cystic or if you see this, the fistula tract heading up through the pharynx. Um, <clears throat> when you are dissecting these lesions, they have a predictable course. They course deep to the other second arch structures, um, but superficial to the third arch structures. So, the fistula tract will pass between the external and internal carotid arteries. Um, it will pass um, over top of cranial nerve 9 and cranial nerve 12. Third and fourth branchial cleft cysts are generally lumped together. Um, you'll find some people who uh, want to describe them separately, especially if they're trying to pimp the embryology of it. Um, but clinically, um, third, fourth arches have uh, identical presentations. And um, as far as I'm aware, there's no key case presentation of a true fourth branchial cleft fistula being tracked all the way um, around the aortic arch or the subclavian artery um, and back up to the, the thyroid gland. So um, clinically, in general, we lump these as third, fourth brachial cleft cysts. Um, <clears throat> these are really rare. They make up less than 5% of brachial cleft anomalies. Um, but they also present as an anterior um, fluctuant cyst um, in the neck. Um, so deep to the sternocleidomastoid muscle, um, they may present as just a fluctuant cyst that's gradually growing, or they might be secondarily infected during a recent illness where they are acutely uh, swollen and painful, but settle back down. Um, they typically uh, terminate into the thyroid gland and uh, you can have a hemithyroiditis. Um, you may see thyroid anomalies. Um, these kids can even be referred to a, an endocrinologist because of their thyroiditis. Um, they are also um, close to the, the laryngeal inlet in the neck and may result in airway impingement on presentation if they're acutely swollen. If there's an external opening, it's going to be somewhere along the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle again. If there is an internal opening, it's going to be uh, at the piriform sinus. And so these patients need a direct angoscopy bronchoscopy to look for the, the opening um, into the piriform. Um, typically, people will cauterize these um, at the time of excision in order to avoid the saliva um, going down into the wound after excision. Um, <clears throat> removal of the cyst should generally um, include a hemithyroidectomy of the thyroiditis side, um, or else you can get recurrent cyst formation within the thyroid gland. Um, and recurrent thyroid surgery, we all know, is uh, a bit more challenging um, than primary. Um, <clears throat> The third branchial cleft cysts will go um, over cranial nerve 12. Oh, sorry, guys. But under cranial nerve 9, it goes around and behind the internal or common carotid artery. And that's what's uh, being demonstrated here. I also feel like it's worth mentioning another brachial arch anomaly. 
Um, and so uh, this is an example of a uh, chondrocutaneous remnant um, that seems to uh, occur anywhere from the clavicle all the way up to uh, the tragus of the ear. Um, closer to the ear, they can be called ex accessory tragus. Um, but these generally are skin and cartilage, uh, but typically don't have any deep extent. Um, once you're convinced that there's no deep extent, uh, treatment is just uh, simple excision um, for the cosmetic um, effects. All right, back to our clinic. Um, we're seeing a 14-year-old patient. She's obese, and she is here because for the past three months, she's had enlarged lymph nodes on the left side of her neck. Uh, she does have a brother who had leukemia at a young age. Um, she has no nasal symptoms, so no nasal obstruction, chronic rhinorrhea, um, <clears throat> no hyponasal voice, and she has no B symptoms. B symptoms are systemic symptoms like fatigue, poor appetite, night sweat. Um, <clears throat> I pulled out my ultrasound, and um, what we see here is an enlarged lymph node with uh, smooth um, borders. It's 3.9 centimeters in greatest dimension, um, but about three centimeters um, in the other dimension. There's no typical hilum um, to this lymph node. It's been disrupted. It's, it's um, very enlarged, and it's one of many enlarged lymph nodes in her neck. <clears throat> On exam, she has multiple enlarged lymph nodes, mostly in left level two and five. Um, they're all about somewhere between two to four centimeters. They're mobile. Um, <clears throat> with uh, further examination on the ultrasound, we see here um, there's significantly increased vascularity, um, but it's very irregular. It doesn't occur in, within the hilum or in a, a tree or an arborizing pattern. It's, um, there's multiple blood vessels all coursing um, parallel um, and a lot of blood flow. All right, so this is a multiple choice one here. <clears throat> what do you feel like is, uh, go ahead and uh, select the one you feel like is the most likely diagnosis. All right, most people voted for lymphoma, and then I misclicked and showed you the Reed Sternberg cell here. <clears throat> yeah, so the, a number of things that I mentioned um, in this presentation uh, for, for this patient um, are very concerning for lymphoma. So lymphoma um, is subdivided up into Hodgkin's lymphoma and non-Hodgkin's non lymphoma. Um, Hodgkin's lymphoma makes up about 45% of lymphoma diagnoses um, and typically uh, or most often occurs um, in teenagers um, and young adults. <clears throat> the Reed Sternberg cell um, uh, pictured here uh, are diagnostic um, for this condition. Non Hodgkin's lymphoma increases with age, um, but extranodal disease is more common than Hodgkin's. Um, <clears throat> the B symptoms that we talked about um, are very important for staging, um, but don't have a lot of specificity or sensitivity, sensitivity in terms of initial diagnosis. Um, so we all like to ask about B symptoms, um, but they're more critical to the oncologist who's trying to stage the lesion and determine if it's a 4A or a 4B. Um, <clears throat> and even the, the absence of B symptoms um, should not be entirely reassuring to you if you have somebody who otherwise seems really suspicious for lymphoma. There's one particular subtype of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma called Burkitt's lymphoma, which is endemic to Africa and due to EBV. Um, <clears throat> it's important for ENTs to recognize that mandible involvement um, is common in Burkitt's lymphoma. Um, and so uh, a mandible lesion um, could be lymphoma, uh, particularly it's Burkitt's. The presentation of lymphoma is typically painless, uh, bulky lymphadenopathy. Um, <clears throat> the lymph nodes uh, almost always are progressively enlarging rather than um, swelling during an infection and uh, regressing once the infection is done. Um, there's, oft, uh, 
typically it's uh, multiple lymph nodes in multiple region, regions. And so if you have lymph nodes on both sides of the neck or um, really bulky painless lymph nodes in both the anterior and the posterior cervical chain, um, that's going to be more suspicious. If, you, if the patients also note any axillary or inguinal lymph nodes, um, certainly that should increase your suspicion of malignancy as well. Um, <clears throat> to diagnose uh, lymphoma, um, they need tissue, um, but they need a lot of it because the cytopathologists need to, or the pathologists need to both uh, look at the histology, but also run um, flow cytometry. Um, excisional biopsy of a lymph node um, generally gets them the gram or two of tissue that they need um, and enough viable tissue um, that they can do everything they need. Um, Sometimes it's in a sensitive location um, or the patient is an anesthetic risk and you may want to do a core biopsy. It's feasible to do a core biopsy despite some pathologists who want to tell you that it's impossible, um, but this is because they need about 10 um, good samples. And unfortunately, you don't know if you have normal tissue unless um, you have somebody looking at the cores um, as you take them out. And so, if you just send 10 biopsies, but only two of them are really viable tissue, it's completely inadequate. Um, and so I think a number of pathologists have made a decision that just core biopsy um, is often um, inadequate and it requires a lot of attention um, and cooperation to make sure that they're adequate. Um, but if you have a, a motivated pathologist who can help you make sure that you get enough tissue, a core biopsy is possible. Um, Another issue is that most patients won't tolerate 10 or 20 or more core biopsies um, in the same lymph node. Um, it becomes very unpleasant. Um, and so in my pediatric practice, I almost always um, head right to excisional biopsy. It's important to send these um, fresh and not, and make sure that nobody puts them in formalin um, because the formalin will disrupt their ability to do flow cytometry um, and study uh, all the characters of the cells. So um, red flag symptoms on the history um, include um, bulky lymphadenopathy uh, in somebody who's less than 12 months old um, when the lymph node is, not, is painless and firm, um, particularly when the diameter gets greater than three centimeters. Um, in preparing for this topic, uh, there's lots and lots of different opinions on what is an abnormal lymph node. If you're looking at primary care literature, they generally say refer if greater than two centimeters, whereas a lot of surgeons and oncologists are more suspicious if it's greater than three or greater than four centimeters. The way I talk about this with parents is I actually go over the bell-shaped curve um, diagram of statistics, and we say if we define a certain cutoff as abnormal, there will be some people who have big lymph nodes that aren't cancer, but we want to set a cutoff that includes everybody that does have cancer. The more um, extreme your cutoff, the more likely that it will include only people with uh, a malignant disease. However, um, you might miss some. Whereas if you set a cutoff that's easier to reach, like two centimeters, you're going to include a greater number of people who still have a normal lymph node. So there is no agreed upon size that is malignant or not. Um, and I'll get more into how to deal with this. A supraclavicular palpable lymph node is almost always abnormal though. So if you are palpating the neck and you feel a supraclavicular mass, um, you gotta be really suspicious of it. Work it up and make sure that um, <clears throat> you get a biopsy um, if it's indicated. Persistent generalized lymphadenopathy, so generalized elsewhere in the body. Um, if your PCP um, refers them noting lymph nodes in the groin or axilla um, or abdomen, um, certainly uh, should be more, is a red flag as well. A mediastinal or an abdominal mass. Oh, excuse me. Um, increases suspicion. So if they've had some workup and a chest x ray or CT has found these um, conditions, that's another red flag to your lymph node evaluation. And then persistent unexplained itching, fever, weight loss, pallor, fatigue, petechia, or hemorrhagic lesions, or hepatosplenomegaly. Um, I pulled this red flag list from a um, national guideline about lymph nodes coming out of Italy. 
Um, but all these symptoms um, are associated with um, an increased risk of a malignant diagnosis. I'm using ultrasound to evaluate lymph nodes, and um, <clears throat> there's a number of red flags uh, for ultrasound features. First, we'll start with an, a normal lymph node ultrasound. So in the upper left, we see a lymph node um, near the top of the screen. Um, it's ovoid, so its length is much greater, uh, one and a half times the um, depth of the lesion. There um, is a, um, can I get, I can get a pointer. All right, so this is the lymph node. In the middle of it here is a, um, the hilum of the lymph node. And so if we think back to our histology of the lymph node, there's uh, a cortex made up of follicles of um, mostly B cells. The blood flows through the cortex to the hilum and back out. And so the main blood vessels here, the main blood flow is in the hilum. Um, sometimes you might see increased blood flow, but it all seems to st stem from the trunk in the hilum and looks like a tree branching out. Um, this is in contrast to an abnormal lymph node. And so um, this is uh, a lymph node of a 14-year-old male who came to see me. He had um, progressive growth of his lymph nodes. The, the hilum is missing um, <clears throat> and there's abnormal vascularity. Oops. All right. So. Um, this lymph node is three centimeters by almost two centimeters, um, and that length to height ratio is off. It was uh, right up against his jaw, um, but here's the third dimension of it. Um, that white stripe, I mean, I guess you could kind of try to convince yourself of it, but in panning through, it does look pretty disrupted. And then the blood flow looks like these parallel um, increased arches, but this is more consistent with neogenesis rather than um, increased blood flow through a hilum um, in a reactive lymph node. Another example of a lymphoma lymph node, so this patient ended up having nodular sclerosis. That last patient had Hodgkin's lymphoma and this one had Hodgkin's lymphoma as well, but this is a 17-month-old or 17-year-old who had a nine-month um, history of, of gradually enlarging lymph node. Um, this one was three by three by two centimeters. There was no central white hilum, and um, this blood flow is uh, significantly abnormal and increased. So my ultrasound red flags include um, <clears throat> round, and so some people talk about the ratio of the greatest to the lowest dimension. Um, being less than 1.5, but if they're round and not ovoid, that's a red flag. If they lose their hilum, that's a big red flag, but there's other conditions that can um, remove the hilum from a lymph node. Abnormal vascularity, um, particularly abnormal, um, uh, well, I'm looking for the word for it now. Um, abnormal pattern of vascularity, not just increased flow. Um, some reactive lymph nodes can have increased flow, but all through a, a normal, Hyler um, arborizing structure. Um, <clears throat> the larger the size, the more uh, concerning um, it should be. But I've seen some four centimeter lymph nodes, not often. I have seen a four centimeter lymph node that had its hilum, had normal blood flow. Um, we still biopsied it, but it ended up being reactive. Um, any necrotic or cystic internal changes are certainly increased um, suspicion for malignancy, particularly if in people who might have a um, Squamous cell carcinoma, those lymph nodes are often cystic. And then microcalcifications um, should increase your suspicion that there is um, a, um, a thyroid carcinoma metastatic to that lymph node. So um, going back to that multiple choice question, um, <clears throat> there was an option for granulomatous lymphadenopathy. So um, these, this is a, a collection of diseases that replaces the normal lymph node with uh, granulomas or granulomatous inflammation. Um, these lymph nodes can lose their hilum um, and uh, they can lose, they, they often maintain their um, shape. The vascularity is typically kind of speckled, um, but not nearly as increased as uh, the lymphoma vascularity. 
Um, <clears throat> one common diagnosis that everybody knows well is the cat scratch disease. This is due to the bacteria Bartonella hensley. Um, transmission is typically with, uh, through direct contact with a cat, either um, a scratch, uh, a bite, or even uh, a lick of uh, open um, skin. Um, cats are generally asymptomatic carriers, um, and our older cats um, can lose this bacteria. And so um, a young cat exposure, or even a kitten exposure, um, should be an, uh, considered an increased risk. Um, <clears throat> early on, um, or most often, um, Partnella infection will cause cervical lymphadenopathy that can last for months. Early on, there's follicular hyperplasia. Um, so that's just the normal follicular structure of a lymph node, but more of them. In the intermediate um, presentation, they can have granulomatous type inflammation. And then late in the course of this disease, after a few months, it can turn into an abscess. Um, these lesions are self-limited, um, but azithromycin could also be used to treat them. Um, <clears throat> there are serology tests to evaluate for uh, acute antibodies to um, Bartonella um, that can help you uh, make this diagnosis in somebody who has a history of um, cat exposure. Um, <clears throat> very early on, um, the cat scratch can look like this with these pustular lesions. And so um, if you have a particularly observant parent, they may have noted that the cat scratch healed up with some scabs and stuff. Um, and that might help you um, get to this diagnosis. Uh, I usually look at the arms and hands of kids that I suspect um, just to see if they have any um, scratches that are healing up. Oops. Uh, another granulomatous lymph, lymph node um, is the atypical mycobacterium or the non-tuberculous mycobacterium infection. Um, this typically affects toddlers. Uh, it most often affects the level two lymph nodes. It's granulomatous inflammation of cervical lymph nodes, um, and they may develop central necrosis. Um, the lymph node can rupture um, and uh, create skin changes that we see here. This is a very characteristic uh, violaceous change, skin change. It's not the erythema that you would see with an abscess, um, but rather a deep red or purple. Um, excision of limited disease would result in a rapid recovery. Antibiotics don't really seem to impact the natural history. And some of these, uh, many of these patients would recover over the course of a, a, of a period of months. Um, although a child like this will develop a kind of a chronic draining wound. Um, there is a trend in the infectious disease literature towards monitoring these without intervention in order to avoid the complications of surgery. Um, however, it can mean um, months of a draining wound, um, which would certainly be poorly tolerated uh, among the parents in our, in my area here in Ann Arbor. <clears throat> A word on reactive lymphadenopathy to finish here. Um, so reactive lymph nodes are extremely common um, and lymph nodes are often palpable even in healthy children, um, but particularly in sick children or those with adenoid inflammation. Um, it's a clinical challenge uh, on when to reassure versus biopsy these kids. Um, but my approach is generally to that a kid with an abnormally large lymph node needs a risk assessment, not necessarily a biopsy. Um, and if all the red flags or most of the red flags are reassuring. Um, so if there's no red flags, I reassure the parents. And um, if they're particularly big, we follow up and monitor for decrease in size. If there's a few red flags, um, we talk about the option of biopsy and the risks of over, um, over diagnosis or over workup. Um, and um, if there are enough red flags that there's concern for malign malignancy, we'll certainly move forward with uh, excisional biopsy. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, though, there's little evidence for guidance in this situation, um, and most of it is expert opinion. That's all I have prepared. Um, I think I was supposed to finish a little bit ago. Um, I do have one more poll. Responses will not be visible to others, um, but if you have any suggestions for feedback, um, please go ahead and uh, type those in, and I'll review those um, later on after the fact. Um, I'll also, um, I don't think there's any chat function, so 
if you wanted to unmute and ask a question, um, I have time. Aaron, that was wonderful. Thank you. I, I love the use of your polls during the, the lecture. We, we have some people around here who are raving about that, so we may have to incorporate some of that. So um, appreciate your help and uh, certainly welcome you to sign up down the road in a few weeks. We uh, I think we're booked out all the way into the beginning of May now for this consortium and um, as are some of the others. So appreciate a lot. Thank you. Um, yeah, poll everywhere. It doesn't get along with PowerPoint great, um, so I had to change everything over to Google Slides. Um, but once you get up that initial learning curve, um, it's pretty easy to keep on using and keep adding to your presentations. It's great, it's great. So um, just to give our audience a little bit of a preview for tomorrow, um, we have uh, we're going to have a variety of topics. Dr. Gross from NCG is going to talk about neck dissection. Uh, Dr. Anthony from IU is going to talk about management of uh, unilateral vocal fold paralysis. Uh, Dr. Rubenstein from um, Eastern Virginia is going to talk about laryngeal framework surgery. And then uh, Dr. Hobson from Emory is going to talk about Petrus apex lesion. So we have a good variety tomorrow and uh, appreciate all the speakers today um, for hanging in there with us. And uh, we'll see you all tomorrow. Thanks. Dr. Thatcher, can I ask you a quick question? Are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. Um, just, yeah, I have time. Just a quick clarification. When you say an anechoic mass, did you, is that more make you think more of a dermoid or a thyroglossal duct cyst? Um, <clears throat> anechoic uh, would typically imply fluid. Uh, there are, uh, so anechoic um, may be a blood vessel or a fluid-filled cyst. Uh, Thyroglossal duct cyst may look anechoic or have some echogenicity. Um, <clears throat> so I would not count that as a um, defining feature of uh, thyroglossal duct cysts. There's been some people um, putting out stuff in recent literature to distinguish thyroglossal duct cysts from dermoid in uh, using ultrasound, um, but the verifying studies have not found it to be very sensitive or specific. And so you can use the information from an ultrasound to help you um, swing your suspicion, um, but ultrasound can't yet completely distinguish um, the two um, by itself. Gotcha. Thank you. You're welcome. I have, I have a little show and tell if you'll tolerate it. Absolutely. Um, so I'll, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, um, this is a... Um, Actually, I met her as an adult, but it would, I guess, more commonly be a pediatric neck mass, but um, it's a, a work type two first branchial cleft cyst. And uh, we did a, um, a three, uh, 3D reconstruction of a CT fistulogram um, of the tract. Um, let's see if I can pull it up here. Can you guys see that? Oh, wow. And uh, you can spin it around so you can see that, how it interfaces with the, um, uh, skin in front of the external auditory canal. So um, I'm planning on hopefully trying to like write this up because it's kind of a cool picture, but um, she hasn't had her surgery yet. We've, uh, she This got infected and we've kind of been limping along with antibiotics. And then now that we're not doing uh, elective cases, it'll probably be uh, a little bit of time until we can get to her. But anyway, that was a cool picture. Yeah. No, as you spin, I, I see a little defect through it. This could be both medial, this could be one um, where the cyst goes both superficial and deep to the facial nerve right there. You can kind of see that hole through. I don't know if that's a artifact or if it's actually a, a nerve running through there. Oh uh, um, yeah, I have the axials and stuff. I don't know if that would be. My uh, partner, Dr. Lauren Bohm, um, has a picture from her fellowship in Minnesota where uh, they found just that. And it's a, a great demonstration of they dissected out the nerve and they dissected out the, the cyst and it splits and goes on both sides of it. So um, <clears throat> you have to be really, super, really careful and really suspicious uh, that it's gonna behave unpredictably. Good luck with that one. That'll be a, an interesting case.
Okay, thanks everybody.